the Bible is an amazing book. It really is more of a library. It is a collection of several books or letters that have been written over centuries that we believe is inspired by God, inspired to reveal to us all that God desires for us to know to come to salvation, although it's written through the hands of human authors, right? And we hear oftentimes on Sundays preaching from the Gospels or from the Old Testament. Those two readings are often chosen because they share a theme. Today's theme is that vineyard. We often preach on those because those are uh, really consistent themes and the imagery is very powerful. The second reading is always from the New Testament, often from the letters of Paul, and we don't often really preach on those letters because they're different than the main themes. When I was in college, it was kind of a revelation to me that I started to go to some Protestant Bible studies. I had people that had invited me and I really enjoyed them. And part of that was the importance that was placed on the letters of Paul and understanding what is the context, what's the history, to whom is Paul writing, what are the situations that he's writing to to address, and you kind of learn all of that and it opens up some of the scriptures in that way. It was also, much more poignantly, what does it mean for my life today? It was about practical application of the scripture, of Paul's writings in particular, but of all the scriptures to my life. Where did it challenge me? Where did it comfort me? How was I called to change or be transformed? How was I called to be more like Jesus? And so in today's gospel, uh, or today's readings, I would like to focus a little bit on that second reading. I said it was a revelation to me about going to these Bible studies because I don't know if, like you, uh, I was a, a cradle Catholic, born and raised, and we had a family Bible, but it seemed like the family Bible's main purpose was to sit on the shelf and collect dust. The scriptures are meant for us to engage with, to open, to be present to. And so we'll go a little bit more through Paul's writings to the Philippians today that is our second reading. So Paul, it's traditionally thought, is writing from jail. It could be in Caesarea, it could be in other places, but most likely or most traditionally we've thought of it as being when he was imprisoned in Rome, facing his potential and ultimate death, right? And so he's writing back to them and the church at Philippi he had helped to found and then he is writing to them really probably three separate letters that have been edited, edited together for this one book of the Bible. So one of those letters was a thank you letter. So in his imprisonment, he was thanking the Philippians for sending him a care package, that he'd received that and he was grateful for that and he was writing to, back to them for that. He was also writing to warn them about a number of false teachers, false prophets, false uh, evangelists that had come in and were preaching a gospel different than the one that he had preached. And so there's warnings about that. And then finally, there's an exhortation to be able to live in harmony and unity, to, to hand on and live what they have received, the teachings of, the, of his, of the church, of Jesus Christ himself, and to live in unity with one another in harmony. Today's reading really is part of two of those letters. So the first paragraph where we hear, do not be anxious about anything. How many of you have ever been anxious? Right? Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. In that verse, it really is an application for us because we all experience anxiety. We're all called by God to share what we're really experiencing with him. God wants to have that kind of an intimate relationship with us where we open our hearts to him and share what's really going on in us. When I was younger, I had used to think like, there were only certain things I could talk to God about, right? Other things I had to keep from him. And sometimes we can think that we don't measure up or we're not worthy, but God has invited us to share everything with him. And so make your request known to God, but let God know when you're anxious or when you're joyful or when you're struggling or when you're, you're really, uh, really in online and going forward and successful, right? Let God know those details of your life and then make your request known to God in prayer and petition, but with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is the word we know for Eucharist. When we come here, we are giving thanks to God 
for all that God has done in our own lives and for salvation history. It helps us to place our anxieties in context of God's faithfulness, right? So when we have those anxieties, when we are thanking God for what he's done, it reminds us to trust him, to trust him in the midst of this current environment. Now, does Paul say, if you make your request known to God, everything will work out fine? No, he doesn't say that. He doesn't say that everything's going to get better, that everything's going to go well. He is saying, though, that the peace of God, which transcends our own understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. It is a peace that comes from that confidence in God, who is bigger than our problems, in God who never abandons us or leaves us, in God who is always with us through the journey and the struggle, who, with the God who has given himself completely for us, and in our thanksgiving with the God who comes to be with us in the sacrament, right? So we see that that peace then is given to us. Uh, the second part, Paul is encouraging the Philippians to think about whatever is just, whatever is honorable, whatever is true, whatever is lovely, whatever is pure, whatever has any excellence or anything that's praiseworthy, to think about these things. If you're like me, oftentimes what I'm thinking about is what I'm watching on the news channel. And what I'm thinking about is what I'm seeing on the Facebook scroll or somewhere else, right? That we fill our thoughts with lots of things that aren't necessarily pure or true or good or gracious or lovely, right? We are filling our, our minds and our thoughts with all other kinds of entertainment, all kinds of things that, that may be those things, but often have an ulterior motive or purpose, right? They draw us out of the, those noble things. Those categories that Paul uses are categories from the Gnostics. So Gnosticism it was a heresy that proclaimed a secret knowledge and an already arrived second coming of God, that, that we were now in heaven, right? That this was already it. So, so Paul doesn't agree with those teachings, but he sees the value in what is true in those teachings. And so he's upholding those categories for us ourselves to really enter into what it truly means to be human, but to pray to God for our anxieties and for things and to think about things, those take time. We have to make the time in our lives to have the opportunity to pray and the opportunity to think about true and beautiful and good things. Right? We have to be able to set some time away. It's a call to change, to prioritize, and to be able to, to really incorporate into our routine the opportunity for both prayer honestly before God and to think about the things that are noble and just and right. The third part then often sounds a little arrogant to us, but, but Paul is saying, whatever you've seen from me, whatever you've heard from me, whatever you've received from me, whatever uh, you've experienced from me, imitate this, right? Do what I have done. We can often think that it's like, well, oh, hey, everybody, look at me, right? But Paul is not really communicating that. He's not saying the things that he has done are accomplishments, he's saying that the things that he has done, he's received from God. They've been a grace, right? And ultimately, it's his trust in God that he wants them to imitate, that they can really give their lives, their hearts, their families, their everything over to God, and that they can offer all of that to him as Paul has done. And even from a prison cell, he can say, then, as we return to in the final verse, then the peace of God will be with you. The peace of God will be with you. It'll be given to you, right? We have that peace because we trust in God. We have that peace because of his goodness, of his love for us, of his mercy for us, of his action on our behalf. The scriptures, the Bible reveal to us that gift of himself, that he is always faithful and that he is always with us. As we come to this Eucharist, we do receive the word made flesh in his body and his blood, and we hear the word proclaimed to us. May our hearts always be open to engage with the, the Bible, with the scriptures, 
even the things that we don't normally do, so that we can open and honestly be in relationship with God, so we can present to him all of our true needs, that we can think about the things that are important for what it means to be human, what are noble and just and worthy and true, and then we can imitate Paul in all the saints by placing our trust in the God who is always with us. May we receive what we need from the altar of God's word and from the altar of his Eucharist. May we receive all that we need from God so that we can go throughout this day, throughout this week, drawing closer to him and sharing his love with others. May the peace of God dwell in our hearts.